talk about uh, Elixir. Uh, I'm sorry for the address bar there, but I can manage to take it off. So um, my name is uh, Andre Lovardi. I'm a recent computer science graduate, and I've been uh, doing web development for about um, two years. Um, I met Elixir about um, four months ago, and uh, I loved it right away. Uh, I come from a Ruby background, and Elixir is often targeted uh, Ruby programmers, but it's uh, pretty much a general purpose language, and uh, anyone can learn it, obviously. So um, I met uh, this language about four months ago. Um, I fell in love with it, and I started using it on a bunch of uh, personal and work projects. And um, I've been uh, contributing to a lot of uh, libraries out there, and um, I've been doing some work with the Elixir core team uh, in these months. So uh, this won't be a, uh, this is a not, a, well, it's not a, it's an, in an introductory um, talk about Elixir. And, uh, but it won't uh, teach you Elixir, so it's uh, more like, of a, like a trailer for Elixir. So I, ho I hope that when you get out of this talk, uh, what, will you, what you will bring with you is uh, the will to try Elixir, um, because uh, it's pretty much impossible for me to teach you Elixir in uh, 45 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, interrupt me at any time. I'd be glad if you did. Uh, so uh, instead of coming up, uh, coming up with a pitch for a nice pitch for Elixir, I just told the one of, on Elixir website, uh, which is that Elixir is a dynamic functional language designed for building scalable and maintainable applications. So that's nice, obviously. And um, Erlang, uh, Elixir is um, built on the top of the Erlang virtual machine. It runs on the Erlang virtual machine, and it's compiled uh, uh, into Erlang bytecode by Erlang. And um, so, in order, in order to understand the Elixir, we have to understand Erlang a little bit first. So Erlang uh, uh, was developed by Ericsson. Uh, that's where the name comes, comes from. Uh, and it was built for handling um, te large telecom uh, applications, so switches and um, a lot of uh, concurrent connections uh, by clients and so on. And it was built uh, in 1986, uh, so it's almost 30 years old. So that's, uh, well, it's a lot of uh, history. Um, <coughs> uh, its features, uh, uh, since it was built for um, handling telecom application with, uh, as I said, a lot of concurrent connections, a, lo a lot of uh, clients, uh, one of the most important features, uh, the most important features that it has are um, high, avail high availability. So it's, uh, uh, it has great support for uh, uh, being available. Uh, and um, it's extremely concurrent. It has uh, a lot of primitives uh, in or, uh, built to, in order to uh, do concurrency. And it's uh, full tolerant, tolerant by design, so it has uh, awesome support for uh, running uh, full tolerant uh, systems. So this is uh, what Elixir looks like in order to look at it for the first time. Um, in this talk, I will, uh, well, the, in the first part of the talk, I will uh, tell you about uh, what makes Elixir great, uh, but uh, is inherited by Erlang. So what, what Elixir in inherits by Erlang uh, um, and which makes uh, Elixir great. And in the second part of the talk, I like to focus on what Elixir brings to the table when compared with Erlang, and why one may want, want to choose uh, Elixir over Erlang. So, um, as I said, uh, Elixir is built on top of the um, uh, Erlang virtual machine and it runs on uh, the Erlang virtual machine. And so, uh, and it's very close to Erlang uh, in terms of, um, uh, for example, data structures. For example, all uh, Elixir data structures are just uh, uh, Erlang data structures, maybe with a different syntax sometimes. Um, <coughs> Elixir modules are just Erlang modules and Elixir uh, functions are just Erlang functions. So the first thing I want to, uh, Erlang is a functional programming language, basically. It's considered a functional programming language, and Elixir inherits that too. Uh, so uh, the first, uh, let's see, uh, first a uh, bunch of um, functional uh, features of Erlang. So the first uh, thing is the Im immutable data structures. So most uh, Erlang and Elixir uh, data structures are immutable by default. For example, in the example, we just uh, created the list, and when we delete the second element, element, uh, second element of the list, we're not deleting anything. The list remains unchanged. We're just returning a list without 
the second element. And the, you can see that the value of the list is the original one. Uh, it has higher high order functions, so anonymous functions, functions that return functions. It has functions that uh, you can pass functions uh, as arguments, uh, anonymous functions or named functions. But it's uh, not, no, um, neither Erlang or nor Elixir are um, purely functional. So uh, both have uh, side effects. So for example, you can print to the out standard output without having to specify any anything else. And both have uh, call-dependent results. So what um, uh, uh, the result of a function depends, for example, on when you call it. For example, the now function returns the current time, and obviously every time you call it, it returns a different result. So it does not have uh, referential transparency. Transparency. So uh, these are the well the basic functional features of the language. Uh, then I will talk about some other features that li I like about Erlang and that Elixir inherits uh, right away. So uh, the first feature that I probably one of the features I like the most is pattern matching. So uh, the equal sign is not an assignment operator in uh, Elixir nor in Erlang. It's a um, pattern matching operator. So pattern matching is something that um, some lang some languages have, but I wish a lot more language languages had because it's something that when you program in a language that has it, uh, then you go back to a language that doesn't have it, it's, it feels really clum clumsy to program uh, in a language that doesn't have it. So, um, pattern, uh, pattern matching is used to mainly to uh, destructure data and uh, complex data and to bind variable while doing it. So, uh, for example, maybe it's easier to understand it with an example. Um, for example, we define a list in the first line, then we uh, pattern match on the uh, left-hand side of the equal operator. That's a pattern uh, which matches uh, the list that is uh, that we've defined before. And so the pattern, the pipe operator is like a cons operator, so it appends the elements on the its left-hand side to the list on the its right-hand side. And um, so uh, that structure means a list with uh, at least two elements, right? Because you have to have the first and second element, and then you can have an empty list after that, or a list with any number of elements. So uh, only lists with at least two elements match the pattern. Uh, if the pattern doesn't match, uh, an exception is raised. But if the pattern matches, um, the variables specified in the pattern are uh, bound to the values they match to. Uh, so for example, the first matches the first element of the list and is bound to the value of the first element of the list. So uh, you can always also bind uh, pattern match more complex data structures. Uh, so for example, we have a four elements double. That's a three. Uh, so you can match on the um, structure of the, the, the table. And you can also, um, uh, other than uh, binding variables when matching, so other than uh, matching the structure of uh, uh, data, you can match also the values that the data that, 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 um, uh, contains. For example, uh, the colon uh, means an, an atom, and that's a string. Uh, and um, so uh, when you match uh, my, for example, it matches only if the, so this, all, this, this matches only if this is a four elements table. And the, it matches only, for example, if the first element is the eight on my, because it's a literal value, and it matches only if the value is uh, the same. Same goes for tuple, for example. How many will bind to the second element of the tuple, whatever the element is, because it's uh, un unbound, it has no, no literal value. And for example, the second element is a nested pattern match. Uh, the less than, greater than operator is the string concatenation. So that this third element will match everything uh, every string starting with ELE, and we'll bind the rest of the string with the to the variable rest of the string, as we can see when we uh, look at the value of the, those variables. So pattern matching can be used uh, in function as two, so you can define uh, multiple bodies for the same functions based on the uh, match uh, pattern that the arguments uh, match. So for example, uh, in, the, in the function, whether we pass something, uh, it will execute the first uh, body of the function. If we pass something else, uh, we, it will execute the second body of the func function. So uh, pattern matching is uh, really often, often, used really often in uh, function heads, because uh, 
for, well, first because it's uh, extremely optimized by the year Longview machine. So doing this is much more efficient, efficient than uh, uh, doing an if statement inside the function. So if we inside the function say, let's well, say, if the, the argument is something, then do something else, do something else. Uh, this is more efficient than doing that. And it's also, I think it's pretty much, uh, it's m way more clear because it's, it highlights, uh, it, it, well, it extracts the conditionals out of the, of the function body where they're kind of a hidden and it uh, takes them out of the, um, well, where they're really easy to see. And also because uh, with pattern matching, you, you have also a, an idea about the structure, structure of the data. So it's very de declar very declarative way to un to read, for example, and write code. So uh, pattern matching uh, uh, can be used um, together with guards. Guards are the when and minus uh, le less than zero uh, part, and the. Um, uh, so uh, that uh, is a uh, guards are um, boolean conditions that uh, are, are evaluated with uh, in order to uh, match the arguments. So, for example, uh, we can in that example we can see that uh, we're it's executing the um, first body of the function. So only if uh, the argument is a negative integer, and well, well, that's uh, that's that's a factorial function, so we're raising if the argument is negative. But uh, what this provides, in my opinion, is um, pattern, uh, well, it's polymorphism on, on steroids, right? You, usually when you do polymorphism in uh, languages, you, you do it through types, right? You behave, functions behave differently based on the type of, uh, of their arguments. Uh, well, here you can both, uh, well, you can do polymorphism uh, uh, with types because there are uh, functions you can use in guards which match on the type of the arguments. So you can ask if uh, an argument is an integer or is a string or is a um, floating point number. Or, uh, but you can also match on the value of the argument. So you have another tool uh, in your poly polymorphism uh, tool set because you can actually match on uh, not only the value, but uh, properties of the arguments. So another, this is all, uh, all I have to say about uh, pattern matching for now. Uh, we're moving to processes. So uh, as I said, uh, Erlang allows to build a very distributed and scalable and uh, full tolerant applications. So Elixir obviously inherits that too. And um, Erlang, uh, uh, in, in Erlang, the, well, the basic unit of uh, computation is the process. So um, if you understand, we're gonna try to understand how an Erlang process works, uh, and that's pretty much all it takes to, well, at least to see the power of uh, this language. So, uh, and the first thing to first thing to understand is that um, an Erlang process uh, is uh, not an operating system process. It's completely different. So the Erlang virtual machine runs in a monolithic uh, process similar to the JVM, uh, and it handles um, uh, processes and uh, concurrency internally. So uh, this allows uh, processes to be uh, in Erlang to be extremely lightweight. Uh, and to behave consistently uh, over different operating systems, uh, where, so you don't have to uh, care about uh, thread threading or forking or anything like that. So uh, a process uh, is created by spawning a function. Uh, spawning is uh, asynchronous, asynchronous obviously, and it, uh, spawning returns a process ID uh, of the process we just that has been just spawned. And uh, when I said that uh, processes are lightweight in Erlang, I, I really meant it. So that's uh, a benchmark uh, that timer TC is timing the, the function that is passed to it. And we're timing uh, the spawning of 100,000 processes. And on my machine, it took less than two seconds to spawn 100,000 processes. And that's not an extreme case because in Erlang, uh, it's extremely common to have uh, um, hundreds or even millions of processes running uh, concurrently on the same machine. And to, to, to confirm what I'm saying, this is just uh, what uh, WhatsApp did. The messaging application, is, uh, is its infrastructure is based on Erlang. And it uh, had, for a long time, it had just one server running with uh, a thousand, hundreds of thousands of uh, concurrent processes handling connections. So it's something that is done and it works pretty well. 
So uh, processes uh, cannot share uh, memory, any memory. And the only form of communication between processes is uh, through asynchronous message passing. So the only way to communicate is passing messages between processes. So in order to send a message, you have to use the send primitive, for example, and you pass it the PID of the process and the message. And sending is, is, is asynchronous, so you always get back the message being sent, uh, but the process, doesn't, uh, the process that sends the message doesn't block. And uh, in order to receive messages, uh, you use the receive primitive. And um, the receive primitive, you, when you use the receive primitive, you list a, a list of patterns uh, where the messages will match on the pattern. And if a message matches uh, on a pattern, the corresponding action will be uh, pr uh, executed. And so uh, receiving is um, synchronous, not asynchronous. Uh, so it uh, process when uh, it receives it blocks until uh, a message uh, matches the ones a message that arrives to the process matches one of the patterns specified in receive uh, what I didn't tell you is that uh, when a message sends uh, when a process sends a message to another process uh, the um, that message ends up in the uh, process uh, where it's being sent in its uh, message queue. So each process has a message queue, and uh, all messages end up in the message queue first uh, before being uh, matched on the, with uh, receive. And um, each message is guaranteed to be delivered to, to a process, so you don't have to worry about uh, messages getting lost or something like that. So uh, if obviously if the process starts receiving and there's no message in its queue, it will wait until there's a message in the queue. If there's uh, already messages in the queue, it tries to match them uh, against that, those patterns. And uh, if uh, it only starts waiting, uh, stops waiting for uh, messages, uh, stops receiving once a message matches one of the patterns. So in that example, uh, for example, we can just uh, send a self, uh, by the way, returns the PID of the current process. So when you're sending a uh, we spawn the uh, process with a PID, uh, which is waiting for messages. What we do is uh, there we're sending uh, that process a message, uh, which is a two-element tuple uh, with the PID of the current process and a message in it. Uh, when the, the process will receive this message, it will match it on the patterns we listed before the arrows. And uh, it will match the first pattern, because from will bind everything and hello will match the message we passed. And we'll re uh, that, that process will respond by sending back a message to the pr process we the send the message in the first place, which is from, by the PA, its PID is bound to the variable from. And it sends back a message uh, with its PID and uh, a response. So in order to uh, send, as I said, send is uh, asynchronous. So when the process that sends the message sends it, it doesn't block. It. And it just in order to receive the message that the process responded back, it has to receive uh, itself. Uh, so it, we have to receive the message. And we, in that way, we can extract the response that the uh, previous process uh, responded us. So, um, these constructs, receiving, uh, sp spawning, receiving, and uh, sending messages, uh, are enough to, uh, in my opinion, to understand uh, the power of Erlang. Because you see that, uh, that uh, since processes have no shared memory, and the only way of uh, doing uh, of sharing memory, sharing data, is message passing. It's very hard to encounter, for example, uh, locking problems. Its concurrency is very easier. It's much easier uh, this way. And for example, we can implement uh, pretty complex patterns uh, using only those uh, constructs, only sending, receiving, and spawning. For example, this is, um, we don't, I don't want to explain that because it's pretty, it's probably it's too much code for a slide, but it's uh, just uh, an, an implementation of the actor model uh, used to keep state, uh, which only uses uh, the, the primitives we described. Th that is just to show you that it's it can be done in with very very few codes, and with uh, it's pretty easy to read. So, <coughs> so um, I could talk, and I would like to talk about uh, a lot more about Erlang processes uh, and concurrency. 
especially, especially since Erlang has the OTP. Uh, the OTP is a framework of libraries for Erlang. Um, and um, so it's a set of libraries which are used to solve the most uh, common concurrency related problems. So there are libraries for handling, uh, for example, uh, generic servers, or for handling uh, events, or for handling uh, shared state, for example, like the one we just just said. And uh, so we won't, I won't have time to dig uh, into it, but if you run, just as I finish the com this talk, if you run to the Erlang workshop, you have the ticket, they will be talking about that. So. So this is the point where um, most people usually arrive at the conclusion that uh, Elixir is just like CoffeeScript for JavaScript, right? So it's just uh, a nice syntax over the same Erlang language. It's just a nicer syntax. Well, that's not true, absolutely. Uh, so um, it's more like Clojure for Java, if you know them, uh, but because it's uh, well, it's a completely different environment, uh, and it has a completely different compiler from Erlang, which is probably what gives it, gives it the most power over Erlang. So, in the next part of the talk, I will uh, I will talk to you about what makes Elixir great uh, and what uh, distinguishes it uh, from Erlang. So, this quote, I think, this quote sums, uh, nice, nice, uh, nicely sums up what Elixir is. And um, so Elixir is what would happen if Erlang, Clojure, and Ruby somehow had a baby and it wasn't an accident. That's true. <laughs> if you know all the, the three of them and you know Elixir, it, it probably is much funnier, but it's true. <laughs> so uh, the first thing I want to talk about that Elixir uh, has and which is really nice and which is something that probably each, uh, every language built on top of another language should have uh, is interop. So when you have a language like Erlang, which is uh, well almost 30 years old now, you want to be able to uh, take advantage of everything you can in Erlang, because Erlang has 30 years, 30 years of history on its back, so it has 30 years of libraries on its back, 30 years of uh, systems built in it on, its, on its back, so you want to take advantage of all that. And uh, interrupting Elixir is ridiculously uh, easy, so that's the first example is Erlang code. We're just calling the map function from the lists module, uh, and we're passing it an anonymous function, which adds to, to the, its argument and the list. And this is the exact same code written in Elixir. So we can see that data structures are the same, slightly different syntax some, sometimes, but the, structure is the, the data structure is the same. So we have anonymous functions, both in Elixir and in Erlang. The list is the same, and we can, we can actually call the uh, map function from the lists module in Erlang using just Elixir syntax. That's, that's just, uh, for example, the colon uh, lists is an item in uh, Elixir, and the lists without, with a, a lowercase first letter is an item in Erlang. So it's just exactly the same code. So another nice, nice thing that's probably uh, overrated, but it's really nice to have, is the pipe operator. I, I, I wish more languages had this. Uh, it's pretty uncommon, but uh, Elixir is not the only language that has it. So uh, the pipe operator uh, is used to is similar to the Unix pipes the pipe. So it's used to turn code like this, where you have uh, a value, the list one, two, three. You do an operation to transform the value, so you flatten it, and then you do an operation on the result of the operation, where you map a function over the list. And this is pretty common in functional programming languages, right? Because you have uh, immutable state, so you're always transforming data. You're never uh, modifying data. So uh, the pipe operator looks like this, and makes that code becomes like this. So we have the data, you have pipe them into the function, then you pipe the result into another function. So it bas basically just takes the expression on its left hand side and passes it at the f as the first argument on the function uh, on uh, on its uh, left side, uh, right hand side. Sorry. So it makes code really easier to read and. Um, I think it's, it, it emphasizes transformation of data uh, with uh, its clean syntax. So uh, another nice thing about Elixir is first-class documentation. So uh, what, we're saying, uh, what we're seeing there, uh, the module doc and doc are module attributes, and they actually uh, provide documentation for both the module and the um, function. 
and uh, they can be accessed programmatically. So it, it's, the support is baked in uh, writing the language. And uh, that's what you see there is Markdown. So the documentation is uh, written in Markdown and it's parsed as Markdown by Elixir itself. Uh, I think it's really nice to write documentation like that because you, know, you don't have to learn another syntax just or writing uh, documentation for your functions. And another nice thing it has is uh, what we see, you see there, uh, IEX, uh, that's the Elixir console, the interactive console. And um, that's a little example where you define a function that adds 40 to a number, and that's, that should be an example, right? Where you use it, passing it 10 and it returns 52. Uh, Elixir can actually uh, parse those examples in the documentation uh, of the function and uh, test them. So you can, uh, you, these are called doc tests. I think uh, maybe Python has them too. But uh, so you can uh, write, uh, you can test the examples that you have in your code. And that is extremely useful both because you can uh, keep uh, examples up to date. You can be sure that uh, obviously examples don't, don't uh, fail or are, are not outdated. And, and um, you are uh, still adding tests to your application, so that's never bad. Another thing that uh, Elixir has over Erlang is tooling. So Erlang is pretty known for having, uh, well, not having a lot of great tools, tooling. Uh, so Elixir has a lot of them. So it has uh, a great uh, rebel, which is the one I showed you in the doc test. It has a built-in templating language. Uh, similar to ERB, if you have ever done Ruby, but it's the baked in right in the language uh, too. And uh, <coughs> it has a built-in test framework, so with a nice DSL for writing tests, uh, baked right in the language. And it has a built building testing and project management tool, uh, which you can use to create projects, compile them, test them, and handle dependencies. It has a package manager, which is not in the core, but is uh, the standard in the Elixir community. Uh, and it's similar to Bundler, maybe. OK, <coughs> so that's it. Um, oh, wait, there's metaprogramming. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with metaprogramming, but uh, Elixir has macros. So it's this is really awesome. It has so much iconicity. This is even more awesome, if you know what that is. I, I thought you'd be like this by now. I don't know why you're not. OK. <laughs> so let's start with uh, home iconicity. So um, that's Wikipedia, obviously. And uh, so in an home iconic language, uh, the primary representation of programs is also a data structure in the primitive type of the language itself. So what that means is that um, each language has an AST, right? An abstract syntax tree, which represents the syntax and the constructs of the language. Uh, in Elixir, that AST is a data structure in Elixir. So it's a, just an Elixir tuple. It's, this is like, uh, it probably will be familiar to uh, Lispers. Because Lisp is just like that. It's just all lists, and both code uh, and its representation is just lists. Elixir is a bit more, well, let's say complicated around this. Uh, and also, the syntax doesn't reflect the, this property. When well, in, in Lisp, it, it does, because they're all just lists. Uh, Elixir doesn't, is, isn't, that it, this isn't so clear when you see it, but it, it's there, and it's just like uh, Lisp. So in order to get the abstract syntax tree of a code, you can quote the code. So you use quote, and the uh, code that you pass to it uh, you, uh, gets converted to its um, internal representation. So uh, each, uh, every, everything in Elixir actually serves represented by a three elements tuple with a, a function name as the first element, some metadata on the, as the second element, and the arguments passed to the function as the third element. Uh, obviously, not everything uh, is represented like this because primitive data structures has, have to be represented in, have to be written themselves when quoted. Because, for example, the atom in the first element returns just themselves when quoted, and that's why you can get this uh, rep representation. And as you can see, this the abstract syntax tree doesn't look very different from Lisp's, right? Where you have the function and the list of arguments passed to the function. That's the same you have there, pretty much. So different syntax, some something different like metadata, but the concepts behind it are the same. So having uh, the abstract syntax tree um, means you can uh, actually manipulate the abstract syntax tree. And since it's just an Elixir data structure, you can manipulate it with uh, Elixir uh, means, right? So for example, here we're matching on the that 
that data structure on the three element, three element stable. We're matching an operator, some metadata, and some arguments. We're actually performing an operation on the arguments. So we map uh, over the arguments and we double each argument. We get back a new list of arguments and we can eval the query code uh, with the new arguments but with the same operator and same metadata and we get back the right uh, answer. We get back the so uh, new eval, eval codes. And this is opens up to really a lot of possibilities because uh, having uh, uh, all the Elixir, all Elixir at your disposal to, uh, well, just, let's say, manipulate Elixir makes it extremely powerful. So uh, one thing you uh, encounter when uh, quoting things is that you can't uh, ac access the um, outer environment of quotes. So when you quote the expression A plus three, and A was the, uh, uh, assigned to be one, you don't get uh, actually one plus three, but the query expression returns A, so the, that's A uh, is the variable, uh, which should be evaluated in the caller's context. So you, this would fail, right? Because uh, you don't have, the, you can access the outer environment in the in the quoting. So to, to do that, you have to one quote. This also this is uh, very similar to Lisp. If you know Lisp, that's quoting and unquoting Lisp too. Here it's just uh, pretty maybe more clear because it has keywords to that. Uh, but when you unquote, substantially, you're just taking something uh, from the other environment and injecting uh, into the in, in inner environment. It's pretty much like a string interpolation, but for code. So you inject some values into the code and you get back the expected result, which is what we were getting back before. So a quoting and unquoting uh, um, makes it, make, uh, it possible to write macros. So uh, this is how you write a macro in Elixir. It's pretty similar to how you write a function, uh, with the expect exception that you get uh, uh, the AST of the arguments instead of getting the actual uh, values of the argument. You get the abstract, abstract syntax tree. And so, uh, for example, what we're doing there is writing uh, an unless macro, which works uh, like uh, if of the opposite of its condition. And uh, we're passing a condition and an action to do. Uh, we're returning uh, an AST, so we're returning a quoted value. And um, we're uh, basing uh, unless, we're uh, building unless on top of if, actually. And so we're, we just uh, unquote the condition which uh, evaluates and uh, executes and evaluates the condition. Uh, and we're, uh, if it's that's false, if that faults, uh, we evaluate, so we unquote and evaluate the action that we would, would like to do. So this works as expected. And uh, this, uh, this really nice, maybe it doesn't show the poten its potential here, but uh, being able to do that means, uh, means pretty much if we did that with a function, actually, if we were, wrote an unless function, uh, the action would be executed anyways because uh, Elixir has called by value, right? So when you pass arguments to a function, those arguments are evaluated before evaluating the body of the function. So the, exp the functions always receive values. So uh, if we wrote an unless, macro, unless function, the condition would be evaluated uh, even if the, uh, I'm sorry, the action would be evaluated even if the condition were, 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 was um, right, uh, true, right? Uh, so this works. And it's nice to know that uh, unless is defined just like that in uh, Elixir. And uh, if is defined as a macro too. So, and def macro is defined as a macro too. And def model is defined as a macro. So it's pretty much everything defined. And this, uh, this is to show that uh, you can really uh, mm, manipulate the language and it's really extensible because it's written uh, like you would extend it. So it's really easy to extend. Uh, macros are hygienic. This means that uh, this makes programming with macros, which is usually hard, it makes it really easier. Because uh, in a macro, you can access or modify the outer environment. So for example, if I have that macro, which just uh, sets the A variable to one, and we say it set the A variable to zero and then call the macro, after calling the macro, A is uh, zero, still zero. So even if the inject variable has been expanded and executed where it's called, uh, it can touch the outer environment. And uh, 
So this can be done. This is just done by default, but this can be done uh, by using the var. Uh, uh, exclamation point construct which lets you access the other environment if you need to. So you can uh, actually modify the other environment, but by default uh, you can touch it. And this makes it really easier to pro program with macros because you don't have to worry uh, that you're, I don't know, touching or tampering the other environment when you're writing macros. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions. Yes. It's a strongly typed the language, dynamically typed. So it's uh, it has strong typing. So when you when you evaluate something, uh, Elixir infers in, in the type of the variables. But you can't. Uh, it's not strongly typed. It uh, all happens dynamically. You can annotate uh, things with types. Uh, you can yeah, well actually you can annotate them, but Elixir doesn't use the annotation. It's used by an external tool that performs just, just some static checks on the code, but it, it doesn't have uh, strong uh, types. Erlang doesn't have strong types, types, and that's why Elixir doesn't have them. Any other questions? OK. OK, yes. Yes. Yes, you can, uh, and you can also actually. Uh, I failed to mention that you can also uh, write Elixir libraries and use them in Erlang, because they just compile to Erlang uh, models and functions. So you can write code in Elixir and use it from Erlang. Yes. Uh, yes, pretty much. So uh, I'm gonna drop the uh, mic. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, I wrote uh, participated to uh, running an API, a JSON API in Elixir, but uh, well, I can show you the the pretty much the the code. Well, for probably this is one of the best. Oops. <laughs> uh, for example, this is one of the. I die. Sorry. <laughs> okay. This is one of the of the thing things. Alexia, uh, this is maybe this is not suited for uh, web applications much as as uh, maybe more for uh, using macros. So for example, this is a router, right? Right, the usual router you have in, in web applications, and you can define routes and what what not. Uh, this scope can get and post are all macros, and uh, this all compiles to a lot of function with function adds. Each function uh, add as a uh, route matches the route, and for example, ID is converted to a free var variable that will bind to the ID of the to the route. So this will be extremely performant when matching routes because it will be handled by the Erlang virtual machine. But in general, uh, it's well suited. And it's not Elixir that is well suited uh, to web application, uh, but it's Erlang because it has it has support for extreme concurrency. It has uh, it's extremely efficient with uh, input output. Uh, so if you there's Phoenix, which is a um, web application framework. Kind of like Rails in Ruby, written in Elixir, and there, if you Google Phoenix benchmarks, you can see what really Erlang is about actually for writing web application because it's extremely performant. Okay, yes. Um, how big is the community around uh, Huge. How, is the how much? Sorry. How Ah, oh yeah. Uh, well, it, it reached uh, 1.0 uh, th about six months ago, so it's production already. Actually, it, uh, you have the guarantee that it won't break for uh, 1.0, and unless bugs and bugs fixing and whatnot. But uh, the community is huge. Actually, there are uh, there's. Uh, I think the hype has gone down a little bit 
uh, but it's that that's probably a good sign because and there's still a lot of community so that's probably a good sign because it means that people are willing to invest in Elixir and uh, I think probably the, the most important reason is that uh, you have the stability of Erlang so you're just you know, you, what you can break is some syntax or some libraries or something small, but you s still have the runtime and the history and the stability of Erlang, right? It can be a reason to switch from Erlang to Well, well, now it's I think now it's worth it to switch, but well, maybe I think mainly because of macros and the Elixir compiler, because you can do pretty awesome things with the compiler. Uh, but it's, uh, I think now it's production ready. It's used in production in a lot of some places, so it's still young. But there's a lot of community, a lot of library, libraries uh, ready for production yet already. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.